Tech Reimagined. Redefining the relationship between people and technology. Brought to you by Endava. This is Tech Reimagined. Hi, welcome to this special edition of Tech Reimagined. If you're thinking that I don't sound like the usual host, you'd be right. I'm John Cottrell, and I'm the founder and CEO of Endava. I'm pleased to be joined today by JT Batson, co-founder and CEO at Hudson MX, and Larry Lorden, the co-founder and CTO at Ilio. Together, we're going to take a look back over the years at the significant changes that we've seen in our industries. And in part two, we're going to make some predictions for the future. Before we get started, JT, would you like to give a quick overview of who you are and what you do? Sure. Thank you, John, and uh, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to join you today. Uh, so my name is JT Batson. As you mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Hudson MX. Uh, we are a, a technology company focused on helping the world's largest advertising agencies transform their business, uh, leveraging uh, you know, modern software and and uh, you know, we started about four and a half years ago and have been, you know, long time uh, and, and early partners of, of Endava and, and excited to be with you here today. Thanks, JT. And Larry? Hi there. I'm Larry Lorden. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Ilio. We are a fintech platform for financial advisors and end users to help them really quickly gain an expert understanding of their investments, especially around risk and exposure, and then help them make better educated decisions. We've been going about a year building the software within Dava, um, and it's been a really good ride so far. And we're about to launch our MVP, so pretty excited about that and very pleased to be here today. Great. Well, thanks, guys. We're very pleased to have you with us. Um, and it's actually exciting that we're working with both your uh, businesses on creating some new technology for the future. Um, but just as we look back a little bit, um, just for each of you, what's been the biggest change in technology uh, in your personal life and in your professional life, do you think? Perhaps JT, kick off. Sure. Uh, so on the professional side, you know, one of the things, so this is the uh, second uh, startup that, that I've been involved with uh, since since the, the get-go. Uh, one, uh, the first was called a company called the Rubicon Project, uh, which was also an advertising technology company. Uh, and you know that, uh, we got going in, let's go 2008-ish, um, 2007, 2008. And, and one of the biggest changes for me from a business standpoint, uh, from Rubicon to Hudson MX, was actually the proliferation of uh, internal tools uh, that historically you would have had to build yourself, uh, but now uh, with the sort of software as a service sort of ecosystem exploding, uh, to where all these internal tools we had to build ourselves and were very expensive, cumbersome, and a distraction from our core product, you know now they're available off the shelf. Uh, so whether it's uh, you know developer tools or whether it's you know productivity or workflow or project management tools or communications tools. Uh, you know, I, I can think of the you know amount of time and money we soaked into to building those to where today uh, you can leverage those off the shelf, configure them for your need, and, and really focus your own product engineering you know brain power and resources against you know what is is differentiated for for you as a company. And so, you know, that less so a, a, a technological breakthrough and more of what sort of the evolution of the technology ecosystem is enabled. Uh, and I think it's a, a pretty profound impact for new businesses as they're, they're looking to scale. On the personal front, uh, you know, I, I left uh, the day after I graduated from high school to move to California from, uh, for college and have never really lived at home ever since. And having the, starting with, you know, cell phones uh, back in the day, but, but really is, is video conferencing, uh, even its you know early days of Skype through you know the sort of ubiquitous FaceTime and Zoom today, you know enabling me to stay close to family that uh, you know has never really lived physically close to me, has been something that has allowed me to sort of pursue the professional ambitions I've had and, and live the life I've wanted to leave while also you know staying close to my family, which is extremely important to me. Yeah, I mean I must admit I've experienced that from the other end with my kids all having moved out now um, and uh, amazingly they still turn up for family zoom calls um, on a Sunday afternoon um, which is something that um, I never had when I left 
when I left home, it was a it was a phone call from a um, a call box, um, probably back <laughs> then. Um, so a big change. But actually, you, what you were touching on on your professional life side, the um, all the tools and uh, web services that are available, etc. I think I mean, many people probably don't realise the level to which you can build bespoke software to um, enable solutions now with so much that's reusable out there as a toolbox. Um, it's transforming the way in which we all develop. It is crazy how fast you can go now in getting started with a, a company. In our latest company, Ilio, we now have uh, a DevOps person only two days a week and everything is automated. All the alerts are sorted out and it costs us very, very little uh, and if I think back to maybe uh, you know, 15 years ago, when you couldn't do a release without an army of people and it was an overnight task, uh, and more often than not, something bad would happen and you'd have to roll it back and it'd be a complete nightmare. To these days, you can get going literally you know, with your credit card. Everything is available as SaaS. So if you're happy to use Stripe as your payment and you're happy to use AWS... Um, or Azure or any, any of the other cloud providers for that. You don't need to bother with DR planning. Most of your PCI effort is, is done with. Um, and those are things that nobody who's been in IT a long time misses. I don't think anyone would miss doing DR planning. You just don't need to do anymore. So, yeah, it's just not, being, not having to focus on things that aren't your core business in order to get your core business started. Then personally... I just think mobile phones, it's, it's, it's the bound to be, you know, mobile phones, but it's the fact that they enable you to be very on the spur of the moment. Um, I can turn up in a place I've never been before if I'm traveling um, and I will be able to get my way around. I can find places to eat, find interesting things to do without having to plan everything in advance. So uh, it helps me be a bit more disorganized in some ways without worrying about it. So what project has each of you been involved with that you're most proud of and what made you proud of it? I think for me, just because it made a difference in so many different ways um, and in terms of an all-round project, be the, the multi-channel activation system we did for Best Buy at the time. And partly because it was a little bit like a movie. It had all the odds stacked against it. Um, the company at the time didn't understand the whole area of mobile phone sales. So much so, in fact, that um, on Black Friday, uh, the year we started, they actually closed the mobile department because it was considered to be you know, a waste of space, really. And then five years later, it was the most profitable department um, on Black Friday and, and responsible for more than 100% of the growth of the company. So from a business perspective, it was huge, but also because um, it was a really good combination of the business and IT working together and technology and technology really enabling meaningful business transformation. And again, other things were stacked up, like the network, so you know the Verizons, AT&Ts, et cetera, didn't really want to play with us. We had to convince them. Internally, we were a, a, a bit of a, <laughs> a land of misfit toys in terms of uh, Best Buy was doing incredibly well and didn't see why they needed even to worry about mobile. Uh, the first week we were there, so this was a team of us came from Carphone Warehouse at the time uh, to Best Buy. Uh, and, you know, Best Buy is a pretty awesome company, but they just didn't understand this. And after we did our pitch, one, you know, we said, any questions? Uh, and one of the questions was, when are you going to go home? <laughs> so it wasn't really like a super welcoming environment to, to work in uh, to start with. But we managed to build a team from the ground up, we built new processes, culture, new vendor relationships. Um, and over the course of a few years, really you know, turned the business around. Uh, we introduced different ways of actually delivering projects that got adopted by the rest of Best Buy. And you know, ultimately, a lot of careers also got started there. We gave a lot of people their first kind of big break. Uh, and people went on from there to do pretty amazing things in all sorts of really well-known Kind of household name companies so so that to me was you know the best all around project just because it it really had everything stacked against it we pulled together a really good team everyone was pretty phenomenal on that from both the technology and the business perspective and it really it had a huge impact ultimately on on the business so that would be my my choice 
it's always exciting when you can see the impact you're making on the businesses that you're working with, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. JT, I know you've had a few experiences of that nature as well. Yeah, you know, I, I, the lots of that resonated for sure with me, but in particular, the comment around uh, how that experience led you know, sort of as a springboard to all sorts of other successful careers. And certainly for me, one of the things I'm uh, proudest of is uh, all of my uh, former colleagues who have gone on to do all these incredible things, whether it was at Mozilla or Rubicon or really all over the sort of technology and, and business landscape. Something I, I, was, I, I count myself as lucky to be a part of versus really driving uh, was seeing the sort of a, a tiger by the tail in terms of the scaling of Firefox in the early days. Those of us who were old enough to, to remember how unfortunate the web experience was uh, in the you know late 90s, particularly the sort of early to mid 2000s where Internet Explorer had, had choked out the competition from a browser marketplace and the internet wasn't great. And, you know, as Firefox started to uh, get traction, the growth rates and the sort of scaling of, of that product and business was just awesome to be a part of and learned a ton. And, you know, I don't know that I'll ever see a, a phenomenon like that, you know, up close and personal. Uh, and, and the sort of huge underlying shifts it caused in the broader technology ecosystem, the impact it had on Google, the impact it had on Yahoo, the obviously the direct impact it had on Microsoft. I mean, the the growth of Firefox directly led to the growth of Google as, as Google was the default browser of Firefox. The growth of Firefox directly led to the decrease in Yahoo, which at the time was the dominant portal. So much so that one of the founders of Yahoo, uh, I remember him coming in the office and sort of pounding on the table, screaming, you're stealing our users. But it was really cool to, to be there so early and, and have a you know, seat at the table while that was all going on. You know, the proudest is for me, it's always when you build stuff. Uh, and some of the stuff you, you build gets lots of public recognition and other times things you build uh, doesn't, but it, it still feels good to, to pull it off, uh, whether it's, you know, building a product, building a company, building a team. And, and ultimately, and I think this sort of ties through to, to what we're working on now at Hudson MX, when you help customers with, you know, achieve the payoff on, on why they embarked on that journey with you in the first place. And, and so what gets me out of bed every morning is, is actually helping our, our customers pull this off. Uh, and, and whatever that this is for them, uh, whether it's, you know, growing their business, whether it's retooling their business, whether it's retooling their workforce, uh, you know, given all the changes that are going on in the marketing ecosystem, uh, you know, that, that to me is, is uh, you know, what gets me excited and, and uh, you know, why, uh, you know, I'm so passionate to, uh, to show up every day. So thanks, guys. So opposite to that, has there been a particularly challenging project um, and how, how did you go about working through it? Did technology have a part to play in that? There was a project we did when I was at Carphone. Um, Carphone Warehouse used to do billing for some of the big telcos in the UK, um, like O2, Vodafone, etc. Uh, and there was a huge project to put in a new billing system, putting in an enterprise service bus, changing uh, the whole way that the sales processes worked, etc. It, it was a monster project. And the issue was... It was in the very early days of SOA. And people now will look back at some of the ways we used to like do communication between uh, different systems. And you know they'd, they'd weep if they had to do it now. Uh, but at the time, we had a very early version of TIPCO. And TIPCO needed four different teams to run it effectively. You had one for kind of long running processes, one for business rules. You had another one for basic service buses, etc. So every single transaction required the interaction of seven teams. And this is in the days before you've got collaboration tools. So you know, there's no Slack, right? There's not even you know, video sharing really. There's no automated build process. And so you've got seven different teams and every transaction has to flow between those different systems. And it's all driven not off nice REST APIs, uh, but off you know, big XML documents. And if there's any mistake, the uh, diagnose, fix, redeploy, retest cycle on that was just hideous. 
Um, and so it could take you, you know, a couple of days to find a problem uh, and get it fixed just so it could get to the next stage um, in the overall flow. Um, and that was that was a, a pretty nasty problem to solve. And it wasn't a really a great way to solve it at the time. Um, but what it did do is, although we kind of fix it just by hammering it out and working crazy hours and things, what it did do is when I then got to, to Best Buy and we came across a similar thing, we had some experience in it. And so we could do things like get a big conference room, put everyone together, get multiple screens so that you could actually see the transaction across every system and how it looked in every system, eliminate as many unnecessary systems as you possibly could, um, and really get try and get one person to own the end-to-end -end process. And so I wouldn't say we, we got it sorted in that first project. It did eventually get there. But the lessons learned from that and the scars from that, I think, helped me uh, with the challenges when I went to Best Buy. And then when we came back from Best Buy, we actually ended up turning that problem of you've got multiple teams involved in really complex end-to-end -end process into a product. And we actually built a product called Honeybee, which we sold to um, Synchronos, which is now DXP. Uh, and that's become a product in its own right because what it enables people to do is it enables one person effectively to build an end-to-end -end process um, across systems, even if they don't own that end, you know, they don't, may not end, own any of the end channels, but you can actually build something where the process is owned by a single person or a single team. Um, and so that lesson learned went through multiple companies and eventually turned into a product. So that, that would be the one that didn't work, but ended up being okay in the end. That classic thing in our industry, isn't it? Taking a challenging situation and creating an opportunity out of it. Exactly. It's so solving your own problems, I think, if, if there's nothing else out there that does that. Did you have anything uh, in this in this uh, challenging arena, JT, that you could share? Uh, unfortunately, uh, and, and I'm not sure that our podcast is long enough to uh, go down the litany of them, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would say the, the challenge is have come in sort of three different forms. One would be uh, we were attempting to do something technically that had not really been done before without an unlimited budget from someone like a Google or a Facebook. So uh, the scale problem at Rubicon of how many, how essentially how much we were processing in essentially real time, you know, and from a scale standpoint, uh, and it was just bonkers. And so needing to do that without a money spigot as big as, you know, a Google or Facebook could provide was a real challenge. And so, you know, that that was certainly something that, and those who ultimately cracked it, and Rubicon was one of the ones who did, you know, helped enable what now is a, an ecosystem that, that powers, I don't know, 70, $80 billion a year of advertising transactions. So pretty cool. Uh, but that was, you know, there were some sleepless nights over, you know, essentially bringing the internet to a halt because you couldn't serve ads quickly enough. So that, that was fun. The second challenge fit under the framework of uh, me misunderstanding the challenge that comes when uh, you're supporting truly legacy technology. My first job was at Mozilla. You know, Rubicon Project was a startup. Everything I'd ever experienced was brand new. Then I ended up joining a company which was a you know really exciting opportunity, but the all of the software, well not all of it, but a large part of the software, particularly the foundational parts of the software, was built before I was born. And understanding, well, how do you chart a, a course forward with the sort of shackles of, of some of that legacy technology? And, and that was something that, you know, was was incredibly complex. Uh, to, to figure out, you know, what's the right way to, uh, you know, deliver value to customers while, you know, also thinking about your, your own, you know, limitations. And I'd say the third challenge uh, is one where I've faced multiple times uh, around, you know, the technical solution maybe isn't the most complicated, but no one ever agreed on the process. And so, you know, so much of the business change that technology is often trying to bring is really more of a process problem than it is a technology problem. Uh, and it's one that I've seen play out in, in multiple instances where, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, ultimately you could have delivered the technology, uh, you know, as index cards uh, that everyone wrote down on and, and, you know, passed them back and forth. But if you had the right process and the right 
framework for that. Uh, but the sort of lack of, of you know good accountable ownership uh, from a sort of what the business process was or or the end goal that you're trying to solve for led to a really challenging sort of software experience that you know no matter what technology you used or or how great your your infrastructure was you you ultimately were going to struggle because of that uh, because of that challenge and Larry I was going to agree with JT you could always remember that the software goes into an environment that may have people in it and process um, and business objectives. And sometimes if those things aren't all lined up, no technology in the world is actually going to solve the problem. One I remember quite fondly is we did a, a project to do omni-channel, kind of, yeah, multi-channel, buy online, pick up in store. But it was the first time that anyone had ever done that for uh, mobile phones, the activated mobile phones. Uh, and we thought it'd be a huge success and we thought we would get, you know, a large percentage of people who bought online and started the activation and process online would finish it in the store. And we got less than 10% uptake. And we're like, this is crazy. Why is this not, not working? And why is it not more popular? And then we found out that the store people, uh, they didn't get a bonus for a, a buy online, pick up in store activation, but they did if it was purely in store. And so people would come in to pick up their phone where they started the process online and the store people would just cancel the order and just restart it again in order for them to get their bonus. Um, and so as soon as they fixed that and they said, actually, yeah, you get your bonus with regardless of where the order started, it went up to 50% uh, uptake. So you, you, can't, you can't fight motivations of people. And you've got to remember anytime you're delivering technology, it has to fit in with the people who are going to be using it. Yeah, I mean, just picking up on that thought, the um, it's, it's one of the classics with any implementation of new technology is is to take the users with you. Um, I mean, the, the classic example in, in our space was uh, contactless payments in the US, which was first implemented in the US a little bit ahead of the rest of the world. Um, instead of ending up as a market leader in that, uh, the, the US went into reverse because um, the uh, the general public in the US got uh, terrified that people would be able to take payments off their cards um, by by tapping their pocket and things like that. Um, so the technology wasn't quite good enough and the communication of how it worked wasn't quite good enough um, and they lost the public along the way and it probably set the US back by 10 years in terms of implementing contactless payments. Yeah, American Express just sent me literally this week uh, just sent me a contactless credit card for the U.S. Yeah, they're just, it's just starting again to to get rolled through, and hope, hopefully this time they'll they'll make it work. But yeah, ten years ago, people were chopping them up and sending them back. So anyway, we're we're at the end of uh, 2020. It would be impossible to have a conversation without reflecting back over the last six to nine months um, and all the changes that have been wrought by this uh, pandemic that's hit us. I was just wondering what uh, what you guys, what's been your strategy for dealing with all the change that's been hitting us over this period? I distinctly remember the financial crisis setting in in, in 08 and it was relatively early days of Rubicon. I remember some very smart people who I respected uh, who were very direct in, in saying you need to you know plan for a very, very, very different world. Uh, and I remember in the early days of, I guess, late February, early March, I can't remember the exact time frame as, as sort of COVID was, uh, uh, you know, looking like it was going to unfortunately, you know, uh, consume everyone globally in, in a way that, that, you know, we haven't seen in, in a long time. It made me rethink everything, rethink uh, what is our value proposition to customers? How do we go to market? How do we engage? How do we think about our, our capital sources? Uh, you know, how are we structured? Uh, how do we communicate? You know, everything had to, to, you know, what are our priorities? Everything had to sort of run through the wash again uh, to make sure that, you know, you didn't have a set of, of business assumptions or strategies that were you know, predicated on a, a different framework and, and could pick on a thread of each of those in terms of how we thought it through. But I think the, you know, from a 
you know, we, we had some things going for us in that we've always had multiple office locations. But I think one of the hardest things for us has been we've been growing very quickly uh, since March. Uh, we have a disproportionate percentage of our team who've never actually met another colleague in person. Uh, and, you know, when you're in a startup that is trying to do something very ambitious and everyone's working hard hours and pushing really hard without having the, the benefit of your colleagues there to cheer you on, to give you a hug, to, to help you out. You know, it's hard. And I wish I could say we've, we've perfected how to compensate for that. We had some good stuff going into this, but we also have had some real challenges going into this around how do you bring that human element and that connection in a world where, and we've tried all sorts of things, uh, but, but uh, you know, that's something we, we definitely, uh, I know we miss and are, are super excited for all sorts of reasons, of course, to have COVID behind us, uh, but, but super excited to ultimately be back in the office again because there's that team element that uh, we're missing and, and uh, you know, we can't wait to be able to be together again to, to benefit from that. Yeah, I think that's one of the things we're all most looking forward to at the moment, isn't it? Oh, goodness. Yes. Larry, have, have you uh, encountered anything in this space? Yeah, for sure. I mean, when it when COVID hit, we were about three months really into the uh, building our, you know, the IT team out or the technology team out. And so, you know, very early days. So we've had to hire, probably almost half of our hires have been, you know, hire effectively physical sight unseen. Luckily, they've, they've worked out really well. But again, like JT, we're having to figure out how you actually create a team uh, when you, you can't actually be together. Um, and so we're doing things like, you know, we do remote um, remote beers and board game evenings, um, things like that. We try and do team social things, but it's not it's not really a substitute for spending time together. However, you know, on the plus side, I don't think many people are missing the commute, and so we're trying to find what the right balance is between when when all this is over, being able to actually meet together and how often we want to do that versus actually people are pretty productive. Um, getting on with things and with all the, you know, with Slack or, or Teams or whatever, you can work really effectively uh, even when you're apart. And the problem is how long can you do that for before you start to burn people out a little bit? Um, and so that's the thing that we're really concerned about, I think, at the moment is how do you um, control the intensity dial when you know people are at home and they they can't go on holiday they're working longer hours you know startups are pretty brutal anyway from that perspective so you want to make sure just just to get the pacing right for people and that you do give people a proper break and things like that it's interesting isn't it it's the human side again and how that plays a part in technology can make things work but it, it can't make things feel great uh, all the time and going back to the challenges question just briefly, technical challenges are quite exciting in a way. I mean, they can be frustrating and all these things, but they're good. Um, human challenges and the human engineering side of all of it is the really hard part. Um, if you can get a great team, you can pretty much solve any problem. Um, so really it's about how do you actually incentivize the team uh, things like that. And so this is this is the new challenge now. How do you make sure everyone's still motivated and incentivized um, and encouraged when you, you can't do it personally? So, uh, I mean, the biggest challenge for me in this area over the last six months has been how to do m and I actually don't believe that doing m and without meeting the people in the organization that would become uh, part of Indava, because making sure that that uh, cultural fit is good is so fundamental to downstream success of M&A um, and, and I just don't believe you can do that on Zoom calls and so on. Um, so my challenge over the last six months, nine months has been how to do travel uh, and meet people um, uh, around the world whose businesses are, uh, we're looking at making part of Indava. I've actually spent many weeks in quarantine <laughs> on the return to the UK over the last six months. because uh, the UK rules are that when you when you come back to from most places in the world, you have to quarantine for two weeks before you can go and talk to anyone else again. So it's been a world where 
the the rules and the frameworks for everything we do have been been thrown upside down. This session, we've been looking a little bit at um, technology and some of the significant changes. There's a, a law created by a guy called Amara that says that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate its effect in the long run. And you've, you've probably picked this law up. Uh, it gets cited quite frequently. I was just wondering whether either of you had, had seen this law brought to life at all. Perhaps Larry, you might have. Yeah, the area of um, just networking, bizarrely. Any any time I think there's an infrastructure change, you see this. Um, so as networking has got better, literally so many things have become enabled that weren't possible before, right? So you could never have cloud computing without really fast networks. You couldn't have remote working without really fast networks. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that you really probably, you know, when you had dial up and various other things that you couldn't have had the things that you've got now. Um, and I think any time when there's an infrastructure change, there are early adopters and, and people take it on and it, it can even have quite a big impact, but you can't really foresee just how um, revolutionary some of these things will be or how taken for granted they will be in the future. So I think so many of the businesses that are around today couldn't possibly exist. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's been uh, exciting to see some of the things that just absolutely explode uh, once they get traction. So we're going to move to the uh, last few minutes of our episode, and we, we usually reserve this for a quick fire round. And uh, this week's going to be no different, but we're going to have a bit of a twist to it. So guys, I'm going to call out some blasts from the past technology, and I'd like each of you to share a 10 second thought about what you remember uh, about each of them. So really quick fire. Um, start with uh, Larry and then JT, if you, when he's finished, he just comes straight in immediately after. So, so here we go, dive straight in. So sure. uh, your first computer. Uh, ZX81. Uh, remember buying magazines, spending hours at the weekend typing in programs on the, the terrible keyboard, uh, getting it working, which was a huge buzz. And then as soon as you turned it off, you lost everything because <laughs> it had, it had you know, no ROM. So... Uh, yeah, that's my first computer. Great. My first computer was an Apple IIe that I stole from my father. <laughs> uh, your first cell phone? Mine was actually a Nokia 8850, which was this beautiful aluminum phone with a slider to reveal the keyboard. Uh, and you could stand it up and when it rang, it would kind of spin around. And that was, that was pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, mine was definitely a Nokia. I do not remember remember the uh, the model of it, uh, but I do remember uh, once forgetting uh, my proper calculator to a statistics quiz in college, uh, and attempting to use the calculator on that Nokia to do fairly advanced statistics, which led my professor to uh, write a note saying, "Excellent job showing your work. Please bring a calculator next time." Yeah. Uh, Palm Pilot or a BlackBerry or both. Had a BlackBerry, yeah. Never had a Palm Pilot. Had both uh, BlackBerry and, and Palm Pilot. Uh, I, I missed the the BlackBerry uh, terribly. Uh, the you know they were excellent at, at phone calls, email, and and calendaring, which is you know probably ninety percent of my life. And the old ones were indestructible, which you know, uh, given my clumsiness, was uh, was super useful. And from a, a Palm Pilot, actually, the first mobile application I wrote was years and years ago, uh, built a, a recruiting database for the Stanford men's basketball team where the coaches, when they went on the road to evaluate players, they actually could pull up the database on their Palm Pilot to see the player, the player's mother's name, their dog's name, their birth date, whatever they needed to know so that they could have an effective you know, conversation with, with that kid while they're on the recruiting trail. Wow. And then floppy disks? Yeah, uh, five, and a, five and a quarter inch floppies. Um, I actually had an Atari ST and I actually bought a second floppy drive so that when I had some games that had multiple disks, I, uh, I could save time, uh, you know, not having to, to eject one disk and put the next disk in. I could actually have a couple of floppy drives there. But yeah, 
the old five and a quarters before the uh, the the slick new three and a half inch discs came in. I can remember those very well. On the the three and a half inch ones, uh, I uh, I used to try to grab as many of the AOL direct mail pieces with the the discs attached, wipe them and use them to to uh, you know store whatever I had because I was too cheap to go buy discs myself. <laughs> I loved a meme that I saw the other day. So uh, son's uh, looking at his dad, who's holding a floppy disk, and he goes, cool, you've made that to look just like the save icon. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you all for taking the time uh, to join us and uh, look back at technology uh, with us today. Stay tuned for part two next week when we'll turn our focus to the future and try to predict what is in store for the next decade.